Meet the dabbler, the obsessive, and the hacker. These are the three archetypes that are not the fourth and final archetype, which is the master. So I recently just finished a book called uh, Mastery, which is by George Leonard. And this book was uh, referred from a, through a course that I'm taking right now on life purpose and just values alignment. And this is literally the first book that he has you read. And the essence is that you're encouraged to step onto the master's journey. And it's a real attitude and way about going, th going about things and living your life in order to excel and become masterful in whatever, the, whatever field you're best suited to go after in your life. Um, but that's the essence of life purpose, which is to figure out what you are here to do and then stay on the path forever, basically. So I thought I'd start by describing the first three archetypes and what they mean to me or how I related to them um, or what I took away. But uh, the first archetype is the dabbler. And when you really read the description of the dabbler, there's a lot of people I can really think of that are fit that description. So the dabbler is kind of the person who gets very excited, is very excit excitable in general, and uh, they get really excited about new things and they're willing to jump in fully and you know buy all the things that you need to, to, to buy to start something new. So whether that's a sport or you're going to start rock climbing and you buy all the gear or whatever it is, or you know, whatever it is, they, it's just jumping in full force and doing it and getting, and, you know, learning all the new things. And it's very exciting at the start of new things because everything's so general and you can learn quite quickly often with most things. Um, but inevitably at some point, usually, you know, six months in or a year in, there's some kind of a block where the progress tends to fade and you start to run into the, the difficulties of, you know, trying to become good at things and it kind of is like a, a wake-up call and the dabbler will basically hit this plateau and kind of realize you know what i don't i don't think this is the right thing for me this is actually a lot harder than i than i thought it was going to be um so i think i should maybe this is the wrong thing for me and they go and they try something new and that's kind of the pattern you just kind of keep trying lots of new things, never really making a deep long-term commitment to anything. So the dabbler never really gets that good at anything. They're kind of just always a beginner, which is very exciting, but they never really stick around long enough to get anywhere with anything they try. So that's, that's a basic overview of the dabbler. Um, the next arch archetype is the, uh, the obsessor. So the obsessor is someone who is very committed to progress they they want to they want to be on the master's journey they want to make progress they want to get there they are committed for the long term they're willing to make all the investments they're willing to find teachers they're willing to you know stay after class and study and learn and read and go to seminars and you know whatever it is however the Obsessor runs into similar plateaus just like any just like any of the archetypes. We all run into something which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, which is called the plateau. We all hit plateaus in life with no matter what you do, whether you're going into business, you're going to be in videography, you want to be an athlete, whatever it is, there's plateaus. So the obsessor, what makes them unique is they really don't like the plateau. So the plateau is a bad thing They're, because the obsessor is really committed to growing. They want to be excellent at what they do, and they basically won't settle for non-progress. So what happens is they work really, really hard. This is the person who's putting in like, you know, the 60-hour work weeks. Um, and when they find that they're starting to hit that plateau where their progress is slowing or potentially even just stagnating, what the obsessor tends to do is... They're like, they try and make up for it. I'm, I'm going to work even harder. I'm going to you know, put in the extra hours. I'm going to read even more. I'm going to really double down because I got to break through this plateau. And that strategy can work, right? Like You can break through plateaus doing that. Now, however, the issue is that 
plateaus are a big part of our lives and there are many of them on a journey when you're on a journey for a long enough time. So the ultimate outcome for the obsessor is that long term they tend to burn out. So they can they can work hard and go at it and focus for long long periods but in the long long term they tend to burn out and and the and what's even more important is they stop enjoying it. They're so outcome oriented that the actual process becomes actually arduous and frustrating and eventually you burn out um, because you're just like, I'm not having fun anymore, right? And now I'm stuck and I can't get to the next level or the next step and I'm, I, I hate that. I want to get to the next level, the next step. So the assessor eventually burns out um, because they're not having fun or they overwork themselves or whatever. So that's the obsessor. The next archetype is the hacker. So unlike the, uh, the obsessor, the hacker is actually quite content. They're, they're quite joyful and they, can, um, they do stay on the past path for a long time. They kind of, the, so the term is kind of, they just kind of hack away at something. So this would be like, uh, a good example might be like a, a teacher, right? I go and I get my, I go to university, I get my degree, then I go get my teacher's degree. Uh, and then I become a teacher and now I have a career and I become a teacher at a high school or a, whatever, a university maybe or an elementary school. And you just be, you just are a teacher now. And, uh, you know, there's professional development that's required um, for teachers and you do your professional development work every six months or however often they make you do it. And uh, that's kind of your career now. You just are a teacher and you teach. And uh, you do whatever you have to do, whatever you, you got to do to keep up, but you're not really in deep study of your craft for the rest of your life. So you're just kind of hacking away. And the thing about the hacker is that they hit the plateau and then they just kind of stay on the plateau for the rest of their life. And they might, maybe they've broken through a few plateaus throughout their life, but they're, they're not really concerned with improving they're just kind of doing what they do and um you know plateau or no plateau that's not really relevant they just kind of do that now for their life <laughs> and uh that's the three first archetypes now the master's path is different from all of that what makes the master's path different is the devotion to the craft itself and to the process and the practice of what they do. So like all the other archetypes, the master too will hit plateaus. And what is known to the master is that most of our lives is actually spent on the plateau. We kind of go, we have it, we have, you know, when you start something, you have a big surge in your skill and you get better very quickly and then you plateau. And this might happen a few times in the early years of whatever you're doing. But at some point we get to this place where it seems like nothing might be happening and you just kind of seem like you might not be stagnating for long periods, but that's really not what is important. What is important is the refinement of the craft and the continuous development and study of the very craft that you have selected for your life. Um, and the master is just devoted to the actual practice. So there are five keys to the path of mastery, which I'm going to go over and we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, just uh, the plateaus and whatnot. But the five keys um, for the path of mastery are as follows. Key number one is the master will find an instructor. So they find a coach or someone who they aspire to be like or who has been already on the path that they wish to be on themselves, and they will find their, uh, their teacher. So you can think of like any like Hollywood film with a, a hero's journey. Um, you know, in Star Wars, it's like Luke Skywalker. He finds Obi-Wan Kenobi and he finds his teacher. And... That's the first key to being on the master's journey. So the second key to being on the master's journey is practice. The master is a lifelong student of the craft. So it's the practice itself that the master falls in love with. And this is the very thing that actually 
makes the plateau not that relevant. It's not important about whether you're trying to get somewhere or the outcome at the end of it. It's the actual practice that you've fallen in love with. The way that I relate to it the best in my life right now at this time would be uh, rock climbing. So yes, I have aspirations like goals for my climbing and like climbs that I would like to ascend. But at the end of the day, like I love to climb the actual present moment experience of climbing and I actually love studying climbing and the techniques and developing the mindset around climbing and I love the physical practice and like developing my strength as a climber and all of these things require practice like we go to the gym and we I have a I have a climbing partner um, named Matt he's my best friend we tr and we practice together we we're always training together and this is not really ever going to change we we actually love training for climbing so it's that actual practice that changes everything is that we're studying this thing because of the actual joy of the study. And, you know, I have already hit many plateaus in my climbing and I feel like I've actually been on a plateau now that I really reflect on it for like a while, like maybe a year. But it only seems like that because it's like, you know, m maybe it seems like I haven't been making progress, but these nuances kind of pre prepare you for the next upsurge. Um, and although like if you, for the rest of my life, if I'm just climbing and training for the next 10, 15 years, like surely we will have upward momentum in our skill development and our development as rock climbers, but it's the actual enjoyment of practicing and going to the gym and the daily, daily climbing. That is why I really do it. And so in many ways, I would say with my climbing, I have found myself on the master's path and you know, I'm still a fairly new climber. I've only been climbing six years, but I've been consistent for six years, like training every week, you know, multiple times a week and studying and refining my technique and my mindset and my, my actual physical development. So that is, uh, that's kind of the next spot part of it is like once you've found an instructor, someone is going to help you on your path and teach you, it's the actual practice that uh, is the next key in the master's path. The third key is surrendering into the path. So in many ways, you have to really, how do I say this? It's like the path is long and difficult, um, right? If you're, on the, if you're committing to the master's journey, like, you know, for me, for climbing, like it's a 40-year journey, really. Like I, I don't, I'm, that's my sport for my life. So what it's going to take and... The, the, the levels of training that I'm going to have to engage in are going to get more nuanced and more nuanced and more technical and more like intricate. And I'm excited for that. Um, but surrendering into the journey is a big part of the ability to stay on the path for prolonged periods. Um, just accepting what is to come and uh, yeah, accepting what is to come and surrendering into the journey. The next key, uh, I would say, is intentionality. Y you have to, well, not what I would say, what the book would say, uh, but intentionality, having an intention to move through things. And, you know, it's not, it's not about sur accepting and surrendering that you're going to be on a plateau. It's accepting that a large, large part of your journey, you will feel like you are on a plateau. Meanwhile, you actually have this intention to move through things and to really push the envelope and push yourself and want to progress, but not minding that you're on the plateau for prolonged periods because that's not really what it's about. What it's really about is the actual experience of practicing and training and developing. Um, the last key to the master's journey is uh, described as the edge, which is you know, as you expand your kind of circle of uh, progress or development or whatever, continuing to always stay on the, cu the cusp of where your comfort zone lies, essentially, right? Like, um, you know, if I relate, I'll relate it to climbing again for me, but I always have to be pushing my edge for what I, f where, where am I scared? What are my physical development limitations? Um, where is my technique restraining me from doing the climbs that I really want to move into? You know, so when I'm always on the edge of what's my potential, at some kind of 
uh, level, I always kind of feel like I'm a beginner because I'm just constantly failing and, you, you know, not, I'm not, I'm always kind of at my limit, which means I fail a lot, it seems like. But meanwhile, that's the fun part is to always feel like you're on the edge. And that's, that is part of the master's journey is you're always pushing the limits and trying to figure out and study what is going to push you to the next, to over the edge of wherever your limitations are. So that is kind of a, a breakdown of the master's journey and um, how it differs from the dabbler, the obsessive, and the uh, hacker. So the thing that stands out to me the most is definitely the plateau, is the master's willingness and ability to stay in the plateau for prolonged periods, even though they're trying their very best and they're continuously studying and developing actively. They are active learners, active students. And they're also very much active teachers often, right? They teach their craft. So yeah, that's it. There's another chapter that I really thought was interesting in, in the book, and it was actually called The, the War Against Mastery. Um, it's called America's War Against Ma Mastery, actually because uh, I guess this is published in the States. But the essence of that is that our, the way that our culture and our society is developed is kind of this get quick, rich, get rich quick kind of a culture where it's like getting results very quickly, getting results without much effort. A lot of, because there's so much marketing being bombarded at us all the time, it very much encourages dabbler uh, mentality, right? Like try something new, try this, keep things very exciting all the time. Like, you know, are you kind of bored with your monotonous routines? Like try something new, try something new. And it's a war against mastery because the thing about mastery is that a lot of the time you won't, it won't be that exciting. It's, you know, when I think about my training, my training for climbing uh, regiments, it's especially in the winter, like you're just hanging on like a board, a little board, just it's not very interesting or exciting. It's just what you have to do. And in whatever weird way, I love it because I know it's preparing me for the next thing I have to do for my climbing. Um, so it's not just some big exciting thing and there's nothing I can do to make it so too much more enjoyable. Like you can put music on and it's nice to do it with a partner, but at the end of the day, like nobody can do my pushups for me. I just have to do them every day if I want to have a strong chest. And that's kind of the war against mastery is that like so much of our marketing is just encouraging us to try and get quick results fast and, uh, you know, very outcome oriented uh, marketing messages. And that's not the reality of what masters are like, whether you're looking at the greats in anything, business, um, sports like the tiger woods of the world these are people who are devoted to their craft and they're willing to work hard for sustained many 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 years with ever without ever considering like i have to get somewhere i have to beat everyone it doesn't mean you're not competitive but it means that your competition is with yourself and you absolutely love that process so that is the book mastery by george leonard and uh, i would strongly recommend the read it's a really short read and for me, I think it's been a very powerful one because it's got me thinking about what I really want to do. I, I started taking this life purpose course recently um, because I'm kind of at this place in my own life where it's like, what do I really want to commit to? I, I want to be masterful at what I do. And, um, I'll, you know, I de I've identified that like with my rock climbing, I, I've, I am on the master's journey, but with my own career and what do I want to actually do with my life and do for the next 30 years that I can actually develop my expertise in a field that's aligned with my core, my calling and my gifts and my strengths. Um, it's been, it's taken some time to really reflect on it. And I've committed the next three months to really like just putting the time aside to really study it and um, get clear on where I'd like to develop mastery in my life. There'll be lots of places where I'll be a hacker and uh, hack around or like uh, a dabbler or whatever. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are, there. I would like to know and commit to the thing that's going to be my craft um, from a career point of view and a professional point of view. 
So if you're struggling with any of those things, Mastery, George Leonard, go get the book. I'll put a link in the, the tab below.